Hello and welcome to Code and Coffee with me, Francis Peck. It's been a while since the last episode in this series where actually we were, we're having a look at the um, coffee tasting experiment data from James Hoffman. Now we'll do again something different from how the series started, which was trying to build up a web application to kind of organize your coffee notes and things like this. We're kind of doing a detour going to Docker. If you haven't heard about Docker, it's a way of getting all your programs to work neatly within, we could say a protected supporting environment so that it can all run smoothly. We'll also be talking a lot about AI and how you can use that to generate images. So most of the things you'll see image-wise has been generated together with Microsoft Copilot, like the poster you see here for C D or A Docker. So let's let's go into the containerization and try to understand why it is so um, useful. Now, programmers, anybody having even just a little bit of, of exposure towards it, they will um, or they can tell you about the dependency hell. So what is that exactly? Of course, when you start the program, it's usually to solve a very specific problem that you're working on. Um, and you want to do that as quickly and as easy as possible. So usually by using other programs that do a, a, a small or a big part of your um, actual, actual solution or what you think should be the solution to solve your um, problem. So then these programs, they can also evolve because you might be redefining your problem setting or you might be redefining, making it better, your, your solution. Depending also on other programs that go through this kind of similar uh, stories, evolutions with their programmers. So it's kind of this role in which all programs are kind of evolving. Um, it's a little bit of false dichotomy because at some point certain pieces of program become just so stable, usually at operating system level, that they don't need or are not evolving too much. Hardware might always change and might then trigger a need to re have a second look at some of those programs or small programs that you thought you would never have to touch uh, again anymore. Uh, so here I actually asked, I asked the um, uh, co-pilot, can you show me dependency hell? which it found kind of too complicated. So I asked, you know, show it based on the nine most common dependency issues programmers are facing. Um, I could then ask, you know, what are the nine most common dependency issues? And it gave me a listing, it wasn't too complete. So I've kind of uh, worked a little bit on what you can see here in, in the listing. Of course, I'm trying to match Dante's Inferno, Inferno and the cir circles, the nine circles that that he describes. So I actually try to align those uh, nine levels and the worst level is of course ending up with the version conflicts. It's kind of the, the, the thing that everything also starts with. As you're trying to use other tools, when you discover those tools, when you start to use them, they're at a certain version, a certain point in their evolution and as your program progresses and you're still depending on those earlier version, that might come into conflict with that, which is kind of a little bit the uh, first level could also be when it's just outdated, but it's in this complex web of all these tools, sometimes also having circular, uh, often or almost always having transitive dependencies. Sometimes you then arrive at a point where your programs to solve your problem, you you re rely on tool A and tool B, and in their kind of further needs, transitive needs, at some point they depend on the same tool C, let's now call it, 
but they depended on in a very precise way with two different version numbers and they both need to, to have that operating or they're not able to carry out their task. So this kind of very deep version conflicts, it's, it's hell. That's, that's why we have dependency hell and that's why people also have been working on trying to isolate these kind of issues. Um, now I was very much talking about very specifically from a, from a program's point of view. You, you can also just think about the user context. Everybody will have their own local installation uh, with specific versions of the libraries and the tools that they rely on installed. And now they find a new tool that they want to install that might have conflicts on that local system. Also, when you're working in teams, they might have other operating systems, which is basically the top level kind of incompatibility that you could have when one kind of tool is developed only for one kind of operating system and you just need the output of it on your own local system, right? So there's, there are then already solutions with having kind of um, virtual uh, machines, which is what we can kind of look at here. Um, if you would really rely on a different operating system or a whole version, different version of the same operating system, you could still just kind of use virtual machines. So you have solutions for that, VM virtual box being one of them. Uh, that's at one end. The other end is if you kind of start to compiling everything you need from scratch, you can do that on Windows with SigWin, you know, if you want to have a Unix tool and build all the libraries for that. There's also the Windows subsystem for Linux now, which is giving you different options, although I think that is running actually in a kind of virtual machine post to Sequin, which is running native. Um, we have the Linux from scratch story where kind of, you know, you're using a system, you're building up all the tools that you need to kind of build a new operating system. And you're also kind of doing that natively. So there you just keep on specifying all the exact libraries that you need for each little step in, in the process. So those are the kind of two extremes. And at one hand, the virtual machine gives you kind of ease of use. You know, it's it's a machine on your machine, virtual, but 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 still, if you know how to operate that, then it's as if you would be in that other operating system on your, um, the, the system that you have at hand. The other extreme, just compiling everything, having everything kind of very organized um, with all the libraries and then linking to them explicitly as you're kind of compiling your uh, your programs, which you get into trouble because some some programs then have hardwired locations for where they expect to find certain libraries. Uh, then kind of installing a virtual environment would help out with that. You, you could kind of, you know, the path and where it looks for tools, you could already change those kind of things, but that's sometimes not enough which if you then would have to kind of jump back to a virtual machine, the, the big downside of the virtual machine is that it requires it to fully simulate the full kind of hardware. So it has kind of, it's not that efficient in all the calculations you have to do to simulate the environment and then have your tool running. Now, containers kind of sit a little bit in the middle. Um, it's, it's an abstraction layer around the core of your operating system which is then called the kernel. So Docker's now also, it started out for Linux, but now you also have Windows-based kernels that have the kind of core Windows running, uh, not inside the container, that's the whole point of the container. That's still running in the operating system that you're working on. Um, and so it allows tools within those containerized environments to interact with those kernels to still be able to run certain functionality and system calls, but then all the rest can be isolated from that. So all the other dependencies can then be put together in that container. And if you have two different applications with different requirements and having those version conflicts, but you get them in two separate containers, you can have those um, version conflicted tools, let's say, installed twice in, in a different container and then run those two tools at the same time 
on your system. That's that's the promise of containers. So here you have some links if you wanna, as I'm uh, moving forwards, if you want to kind of move along, uh, experiment with some things, you can go here. Um, I, I don't think I'll actually do any coding specifically during this uh, um, presentation, but um, you can pause and then um, come back when you have Docker installed. So you have options if you're running on Linux, the engine, kind of the core program for, for Docker is sufficient. If you're on Mac OS or Windows, you do kind of have to have that desktop environment installed, which gives you the desktop environment that gives you kind of um, an overview of all the containers images that you have sitting um, and, and things like this and comes with that engine. So basically um, it's then a no brainer. So um, what kind of workshop do we have here? I was asked to make this kind of a workshop for um, B cubed. That's one of the European projects that I also work on a little bit. Um, and that is to get this kind of standardized data cube format for biodiversity data so that we can more easily exchange the biodiversity data. Um, and, you know, if we have workflows to process, B cubes, let's say in a certain way, that would then be very easy uh, to just run one analysis on different kind of cubes in different kind of uh, settings. So I was tasked with this. So I went to Microsoft Copilot and I just asked question, how can I access and use biodiversity data? And what we see in cursive now is just the response I, I got. I see that you're interested in accessing and using biodiversity data. Biodiversity data or information about the diversity and distribution of living organisms on earth, you know, and so forth. Uh, it's important for conservation, research, education, and policy making. So there's also many sources and platforms that you can use to do that, but one of the main ones is uh, GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Um, so it's an international network and data infrastructure. So you have the GBIF website, there's also an API, API and then there is an R package. Uh, so here it's already going in a very specific programming language way, one could say. Now in biodiversity data, there's go going to be lots of errors, gaps, biases, inconsistencies. So before just thinking, you know, there's just one magic green button on which to press and I'll get my analysis. It's usually just not that easy. So it requires kind of very specific data processing routines uh, to get everything in, in a nice format to then do your processing. So that, that's also kind of the, the promise of Pcube that you then end up already with that processing having been done for you, um, you know, if there, these cubes exist for regions and species that you are actually um, interested in, you can just then start with that cube and not have to worry about all that kind of um, pre-processing. So we kind of already got that overview introduction from Copilot. So then I just asked, you know, can you create a Docker file to illustrate both a workflow in Python, which is of course my favorite, and in R, performing a biodiversity analysis and creating a biodiversity indicator using the GBIF API. So, um, you know, it, it first already wants to apologize. It's very specific and technical, but you know, it, it tried its best. Um, and so first starts out with having a base image. Now what's the base image? So we have a container. And um, you know it works around a kernel that's kind of outside of the Docker environment, so it needs something that's compatible with that. But other than that, in the image, it will kind of be like a hard drive where you have all those tools installed. It's kind of a, a simulated hard drive, which in the end is just also kind of just like a file structure that has all the different directories, bins, and lips, and everything you kind of need with. Uh, as a, as a place for, for to install tools and then be able to um, use them. So a basic image is something you, you just start with. In theory, you can also say to Docker, you know, I want to scratch, uh, scratch, just blank, a 
blank hard drive where I will put all the tools, everything to compile and, and get everything working. But of course, everybody needs to work with some image and most of your tools will have a lot of similar dependencies requirements. So you could already just have those in a base uh, image. So there's repositories where you can find all kind of images and any image, any container that has been made, in theory, you can use it as a base for derivative containers, you could say that have a need for all the requirement and dependencies that are already in the base image, but then add things to that. So you, usually you would specify something and most examples you just start with the Ubuntu kind of latest version environment. Now it goes already further in details with the RGBIF package. So that's the GBIF package. It's kind of a wrapper around the API for GBIF, but uh, coded um, in R. And now, of course, it wants to make something very concrete. So what would be a concrete biodiversity analysis? So you would need kind of some metric that you define some bio indicator. Um, so it will calculate and map that indicator. And that would be the kind of basic analysis that, that, that we want to um, illustrate. So here, here it has generated it. And as I said, it's this kind of, uh, you know, from Ubuntu latest. Um, so that then goes to the next step. So you see from, that's how you specify your base image. Then it goes to having kind of run statements. So those are, you know, it's, it's a little bit like an onion, this container, because the image is built up already of layers, even the base image that you might start with. And then at each run step, it kind of makes a little layer around that, a layer in which files are either created for this new image or files are being deleted that are no longer required from the base image that you started with or the previous layers that you worked with. So here we're basically just using the Ubuntu command apt-get to kind of install, um, you update the registries for the packages and install all the things we need to run a Python or an R script, which would be, in this case, Python 3, pip to install Python packages, the airbase and air CRAN or gbif um, a way of installing that or gbif package. Then it says, you know, I will copy those scripts, Python and R scripts to the working directory, which should run our analysis. And it then kind of defines the commands when you would start your containers without any further specifiers, what it should be running. And here it makes its first apparent mistake because there's no logic in putting two command statements one under the other, it's the latter statement will just overwrite that previous one in a kind of new mini layer. So there's there's no logic kind of to this to this setup. But it, it, it tried to accommodate my wish, which was to have both uh, workflows in Python and in or there. Apparently for Python, it just calls it hello.py. And then we do have something on hummingbirds in or what? might we have. Mm. Of course, in this step and with this question, so it generates that that kind of Docker file that specifies all the requirements and all the files that need to come there to be able to run, uh, you know, your script and, and solve your problem. But, you know, and this is definitely a good start, but I, I would require the content of HelloPy and or Hummingbirds or that you mentioned in that file. So then it Again, that was my question to co-pilot. And then for Python, well, it's it's not just the title, hello, Pi. It's basically that it thinks that all Python should do is print, hello, this is a Python script. Um, and for R, it then just, you know, it seems to be a little bit more motivated. You could say it's biased towards R for this biodiversity analysis whatever could be the reason for that. I guess there's some important groups working on biodiversity that have a preference for R and that's kind of built in here. Now, I, I do need to mention for people not knowing that much about programming that there's about 1% people working with R and I think it's about 16% working with Python. It's at this kind of moment, one of the most popular programming languages and notwithstanding that, Copilot is, one could say, still smart enough to say, no, no, this analysis it's hand, has been done more frequently in R, so I will just focus on R to get 
this going. So it's then defining the taxon key, which is apparently, I have to phrase this carefully, the taxon key that Copilot thinks is the taxon key for hummingbirds. Then it goes on to use the occurrence search um, that it loaded from one of those libraries, supposedly, of course, from the RGBIF library. And this is a small downside of R. It's not that explicit in where it's loading things into its working memory and where functions are kind of defined. So for Copilot, it's probably not a problem because often when it finds similar kind of scripts, they would all call the same kind of libraries and then um, also the same kind of functions. Then it's defining the spatial extent. Of course, when we do biodiversity data, usually we want to put that on a map. So here it's kind of saying where where on the world map are we actually um, gathering our um, data. So um, it's not passing on that extent when it's uh, doing the search. Um, it just wants them to have coordinates and it just say, uh, you know, a limit of thousand, give me thousand occurrences of the hummingbirds. And then it goes on with creating a raster. So it's one thing having kind of all observations all over the place, but when we don't want to do some statistics, usually we, we then want to put this in kind of boxes. So that makes it easier, at least for some statistics. You do have options to work with, you know, eg the exact locations, I mean, all, Occurrences will have also a measuring. Everything that you measure has some kind of a measuring error, um, of course. But when you put it to a raster, you're kind of grouping these kind of observations um, or occurrences. So then we have that raster. You know, we're just saying this is how our raster looks like. You know, we want to just kind of now assign all the different occurrences to, you know, which is the box that it happens to fall in. And that's what we then have in this kind of second step with the hummingbirds raster. Um, and once you have all your kind of occurrences in one box, you can then kind of calculate a richness of species. How many different hummingbirds do we have in that cell or the other cell? And of course you want to end up with then kind of plotting and the one side this um, raster with the hummingbird occurrences and on the other side also the uh, the richness and how many different hummingbirds do we have in each raster cell of course as a pythonista a hardcore pythonista i was not happy with just having hello i wanted more than hello so i said to copilot can you make a python script alternative that has the same result as the r script you made so then it goes on to um, importing pygbif um, and having all those libraries there. And, and it's, I don't know if it's just nicer in Python, but it, it still is like, no, I'm still going to tell you, hello, I'm a Python script. So it's not removing that line. It's really kind of expanding on what it made earlier. And the script is still called hello.py. Um, or it don't, didn't tell me to name it differently. That would be kind of logical in this setting because it was still defined in the docker file that it first made as hello.py so if you now give it the hummingbirds.py name the docker file would also of course need to be adjusted so this is always kind of also makes you think how you know do you work with a docker file where you're kind of you might be changing your environment and all the python libraries that it's mentioning here now it didn't know about that before because it thought it just had to say hello so you would also need to have them installed in the docker file so at this point when you're kind of already working on your script to do the specific analysis you would have to work in parallel on that docker file to uh, install those packages in a, in a separate run statement or you could connect it to a previous run uh, statement as you're expanding on a container it is usually easier to add run statements because then you can reuse the layers you've built up to this point so that then it usually goes quicker. If you have to rebuild a full container, um, it has to rerun those steps one, one by one. And especially if you change something in the very beginning, that in the onion, that kind of layer changes so then it knows it cannot reference that base image anymore. So it needs to 
rebuild the whole thing step by step and then you lose most time so even when you're making changes to your docker file in the container you want to run it in it's good to think about you know do you already now need to refactor the beginning of your docker file or might you do this later so now the part of the scripts here it is building up a raster template just like they did in the other one it's aggregating those occurrences in the Hemingsburst raster defining the richness also by um, having that Hemingbird's data frame with geolocations um, and then um, uh, determining with a merge operation uh, the, uh, the the richness of the of the species and it then also goes to um, doing let's say um, a transform for I guess the locations and plotting with matplotlib so it's showing the Hemingsburst raster with that extends just like it defined that in R and then we also um, set the title you know so it's kind of making two subplots uh, on one row and two columns and it ends up with plot show which within a docker container is you, you can have your docker container work in kind of an interactive way and and show plots it takes a a bit a lot of extra fiddling to get it working but it is possible even on windows so maybe if we at one point do an advanced workshop we might dive into that but this is already kind of again a kind of a mistake you know you would want to do a, a safe fix and a kind of a location where you could then expect the file to be saved and that you can open it up um i kind of finished this kind of introduction with then saying you know to copilot well now we did everything um you know and now let's get our hands dirty what which was the prompt so the prompt is just what you kind of write to microsoft copilot and it kind of takes into account all our previous discussion about generating those scripts and it then created this nice um, friendly beard looking programmer i imagine uh, that is just ready to dive into programming and of course, it, it means a lot of debugging. Uh, so what we will now do is actually go and have a look at Copilot itself. So I prepared this, this workshop already a, a bit of a time ago. And now we can just ask, you know, because um, a small spoiler alert, but it wasn't hummingbirds that uh, he was kind of analyzing. It was bad. So, some, some, for some reason, um, it wants to study hummingbirds, and it got the taxon key for bats. Which is maybe there's just so much bad information, bad data out there. Who knows? Maybe because of the unmentionable that uh, it's stuck with that correlation. It just, just too curious it wants to know rather about bats than hummingbirds although hummingbirds there's like i would i would say sweeter so um, maybe it found in written form people are talking about hummingbirds rather than bats but then if you look at the data they're apparently doing a lot of bat analysis so i guess that's how it goes now um and i prepared this workshop slides everything that was one discussion each time you go back to Copilot, so when you want to experiment with this yourself, you just go to copilot.microsoft.com. You start with a clean slate. So um, this is just really live. So let's just uh, give it a try. Um, can you make me a coffee biodiversity analysis example? And, you know, I could ask Dockerfile again, the whole, but we know that's, you know, a bit complicated. So um, in R, using or GBIF to get Madagascar coffee data and showing the richness of species, which should be you know, coffee species across the island. 
Okay, so I do also try to be friendly, even though we know it's just a matrix. It's just calculating, you know, going to its matrix. My question, my prompt is transformed into a series of numbers, and then that that is, uh, you know, being built. So rather than <laughs> Rather than now running this code, which I know because I had to do a lot of debugging on the ones I generated previously, this is not just going to run. It might, it might, but uh, I don't assume so. But um, can you visualize how the result would look like? Okay, so let's see. Um, if it's uh, certainly, let's create a simple bar plot to visualize the coffee species richness. So now I'm getting a bar plot. I'm yes, but can you visualize? But I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing it. Um, can you show me? Can you show me that illustration, that picture? Okay. Can you show me that picture? I, I, at this point, I should say, I, I can because I'm not running your code. Ha, but now I got it. Got it. It's just too eager, you know. It's a pleaser. It's a people pleaser. So if you just insist a little bit, it will generate you something. Um, and we have one thing that looks like a plot. Uh, it's it's kind of not, not really. Would, would it be the altitudes? Would it be the altitudes that it's kind of, uh, you know, the coffee species? Of course, we know there's variance. On top, it might be Arabica, and on the bottom, Robusta. And then it, it looks very nice, that that definitely. So, and then we have, uh, you know, is this kind of a root system? Uh, um, we could look, it, it has a Rubiaceae kind of, this one, I would say. Uh, I will uh, have to contact my colleagues that are specialized in these kind of determinations and here it's having more focus for Madia Gassasi of course um, that's a, a little bit of a hallucination and here uh, uh, this one also kind of has a bar plot in there so um, in summary we kind of went all over the place uh, we started out, you started out not knowing maybe anything about Docker or containers and at this point you kind of already saw how you define a kind of image. Um, if you would want to do this for real, you would now kind of, you know, you would start out with copying the Docker files that you got into a repository. You would then first do a Docker build command where you're building that image. And after that, that's completed, you do the Docker run. So in the case of these uh, AI generated scripts, it would just fail because it's 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 filled with bugs uh, that you then kind of need to look up and uh, eliminate. Now I was able to, after a few hours of work, I was able to get it debugged and running and producing an image on the bats, of course, not the hummingbirds or the coffee for that workshop. But so, how can you use Copilot for, for your benefit? Uh, if you're not experienced with anything, if you're not experienced with Docker, I might not recommend you to go there and do that. I might recommend you to ask Copilot, can you provide me with a few links of very good tutorials that, that have uh, a high return on investment, let's say for, for teaching me how to use Docker. At this point in time, so we're talking here 2024, that is still the best thing to do if you're pressed on time. Um, but, you know, it is fun to go explore and then just see what kind of result you have so thank you for following this episode and hope to see you a next time
Thank you. Mensch, ist er. Er hat die ganze Zeit, aber so leid, wie ihr bent. So leid. Aber es ist hier ein Ende-Film. Ende-Film. Wir haben das hier ein Ende-Laten, denke ich. Ja. Ja.